when people representing their groups want to enter into a federal bargain, there are some questions that we must immediately answer. First, who are these people that can enter into a bargain? Are they the legal, legitimate representatives of the constituent units? Everyone talks about what happened prior to 1966 in the First Republic. The restructuring that went on that time had political parties and had the regions. They were the people, you know, um, taking part in the bargains. Today, our political parties have all but disappeared. They are not part of this whole movement. The action group had as its motto, unity through federation. The political parties are a problem. The states are even more problematic. So see what we are doing. We are like Enoch, the overzealous Christian who is weeping more than the bereaved. You say, listen to what you say. We want more powers for the states. But the states have not told you so. Many state governors are afraid to get more powers. Okay? Now, the guys who are calling for restructuring of different kinds are precisely people who have no locus, no legal, legal locus to drive this process. Because these are self-appointed contested leaders of groups that you know have emerged all over the place it's difficult now to tell who the authentic voices are but i tell you who those authentic voices are and that's how bargaining happens there are legal entities the national assembly is one of them in the national assembly we have our own representatives we have sent them there to go to represent us in South Africa, they looked at the Senate and they said, you know what? These guys think they are bearers of central authority and they don't seem to know what they are doing. So we should change the name of that Senate so they know where they belong and what is expected of them. So they changed the name from Senate to Council of Provinces. Because they said to them, when you go there, don't forget that you have come to represent the province. Just in case we don't remember. But our National Assembly is there, and very soon I am going to tell you that the National Assembly has made itself one of the obstacles to our restructuring. The political parties, the states, the states. So, let me argue that a great part of the demands that have led us to this whole debate about restructuring is attributable to the dysfunctionality of the states. The states are dysfunctional. Political parties are dysfunctional. How, I ask, you ask me? Look, when IPOP says, and every person in Aba is saying it, we are marginalized. How are you marginalized? They say, come and see the roads. We don't even have water to drink. We don't have good schools. We don't have hospitals. For Christ's sake, what are the state governments doing? <laughs> Mind you, the states say, oh, well, we don't even have the resources. So we cannot do those things. But you know, that's not entirely true. 52%, I don't like statistics, but please let me use this one time. 52% um, of our total public expenditure, public good public expenditure, is by states and local governments. 52% by states and local governments. Very little to show for it. Okay? Very little to show for it. Let me even tell you one secret. Do you know that our federal government has the trappings of an effective government in a way that state governments don't have? The federal government is very powerful, but it is balanced by the National Assembly, by civil society, by the judiciary, and every person 
in the manner that state governments are not hounded at all? Now, state governors tell us that they don't have money to do the kinds of things that they want to do, or even that the Constitution does not allow them. It is true that there are 68 items on the exclusive legislative list, only about 16 or so in the concurrent list. That's cute. It's not very good. We need to talk about that. But do you know that on June 12th, many state governors declare public holidays and that that's a violation of the Constitution because public holiday is on the exclusive legislative list? <laughs> do, do you know that? So, who's stopping which state government from doing what it wants to do? Okay? Everywhere in the world when people talk of true federalism, it is because the state governments, or by whatever name they are called, are also in the forefront of activating the federal principles and saying, give us our turf. Governors and the states that they govern must also become activists. They must wrest powers from the government. And many state governments have done so. The other day, Lagos State came up with hospitality taxes. And the federal agency, the tourism board, says, no, 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 this is a matter for the federal government. They went to court, and Lagos State won. Lagos State created new local government councils, and the federal government withheld, you know, um, allocations to those councils, and they went to court. And the court ruled that Lagos State was right. So, you want to restructure. One of the key instruments for restructuring is judicial review. And that's why the Supreme Court is there. You go to court, test the waters, and do all of those things. Look, in South Africa, in 1994, independence came. And KwaZulu-Natal, one of the nine provinces, adopted his own constitution, adopted his own flag, and adopted his own anthem. And the national government says, no, this is treason. And the guy said, let's go to court. They went to the Constitutional Court, and the Constitutional Court ruled that every province has a right to a constitution, to an anthem, and to a flag. So our state governments need to become more active in this restructuring process, not just a debate. They must do things that will reduce their dysfunctionalities. They must stand up to be counted. There is very little governance in many of our states. There is very little transparency. There is very little accountability. <laughs> now, if states, if states stand up, then restructuring would become more active. Because the things that you are asking for constitutional amendments for would have taken place even through practice. Federal constitutions are not always the, the best indicators of how federal a system is. It is in the practice, in the doing, that you find true federalism. So our states must go there and do that. Now, let's go back to games. If you're playing a game, you also expect that you won't lose. So all potential beginners in a federal situation have their own expectations of the benefits of joining a federation. The philosophy of federalism does not include the benefits only for the resource rich and the richest. Many people who desire to join a federation do so because they expect benefits that staying alone they will never get. So if other parts of the federation are wealthy, it is good for everyone because we all benefit from that wealth, knowing that today the wealth may be here, tomorrow it can be there. 
There is no stopping that expectation of federalism. People talk about greed. People talk about corruption. These are personal attributes. And what we forget is that they can become group features, group greed, group corruption. So some people who tweak the restructuring debate in Nigeria today have at the back of their minds certain opponents of restructuring who they claim are the real beneficiaries of the central government. So for as long as that central government, the federal government remains strong, so they will remain feeding fat. But the truth is that all of us find ourselves in that federal bargain and we must all benefit from it. What you ask for is let the federal government do its job. Let subsidiarity, the one that says let the, 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 the level of government closest to the problem deal with that problem, let it happen. Our local governments must stand up. They must become less dysfunctional. Our state governments must stand up. They must become less dysfunctional. Now, finally, if in practice we get back to strong federal government, strong state governments, we still have certain obstacles to effective federalism. The first obstacle we have, the political parties. The political parties are imperial organizations. They actually reproduce in their kind the power of the center. The state branches of parties don't exist. That's unfederal. The state branches must exist. The local branches must exist. Political parties need to become federal structures. In the theory of federalism, the animation of federalism rests squarely with the political parties. The direction that the federal system is going to go is determined by political parties. Our parties have voted for a determinate center federalism. Our political parties are unitary structures, and unitary structures cannot but contradict federal principles. Second obstacle, labor, labor unions. Yes, my time is up, I know so. It's up, it's up, it's up. But not until I've said this. <laughs> labor. Labor is on federal. And so labor unions go on strike and they tell you the federal government and the state governments must have uniform salaries. You must pay the same thing. That's on federal. Civil society, the way it has come, is also an obstacle to effective federalism. The focus is on federal government and very little focus on state governments. All the governments must be under scrutiny. Public poverty. So, you see, I am sure that you would now no longer worship an unknown God.